Everyone I met with, and there were many, said, tell me the tools you need to be successful. You know what is necessary. Tell me as the governor to make sure you have the necessary resources. And at a time when others were recklessly calling for defunding the police, I actually increased funding. And we delivered results. We worked together to have tailored, targeted, and intentional strategies, all to disrupt and drive down specific areas of crime. And we started with gun violence. And we formed the Interstate Task Force on Illegal Guns to break up sophisticated criminal networks and stem the tide of illegal guns flowing into our streets, breaking up that iron pipeline that was resulting in so many deaths on our streets. First of all, we boosted coordination between our troopers and other agencies, indeed other states. We employed hotspot policing, sending police into the most impacted areas instead of just everywhere, just going where it's most needed. We fought for record funding for the Gun Involved Elimination Initiative, which supports law enforcement statewide. And all of that worked. And the latest evidence is right here on this table. And I want to call out, and you'll understand why, great leaders we have in this room. Our new superintendent, Superintendent James, Basil Sagos. You might be wondering why we have the commissioner of DEC here, and you'll soon be aware and all the agency law enforcement who are joining us here today. What you see are two illegal rifles, an AR-15 and pistol components, counterfeit money, and 3D printers, all seized by Troop G's Special Investigations Unit just this past Friday night. This is an ordinary Friday night, right over in Rensselaer County, just 20 minutes from where we are. And I want to recognize the DEC Force Rangers who first responded to the complaint. They did a thorough investigation and determined that state police needed to be involved. And they are the partners that help keep us safe, getting these guns off the streets. So I want to thank them. But this is not just a one-off. This is the type of aggressive policing that our state police have been engaged in every single day. And it's borne out in the numbers. State police illegal gun seizures are at record highs, up 160% since I took office in the summer of 2021. And we're keeping guns away from people who pose a danger to themselves and to others. We've strengthened the red flag laws, the extreme risk orders of protection. All those by state police number of extraordinary has gone up over 1,300%. And today I'm announcing the latest data from 2023 shows that 1,385 red flags, again, this is to alert people that there are people who could do harm to themselves or others, all in 2023 for a total of 2,500 guns. Uh, all those guns were seized as a result of this initiative. Already today, we track these numbers. I read them every single week. We've already had 290 red flags, seizing a total of 590 guns just this year. And we filed more ERPOs, as we call them, in the first two months of 2024. Now, first couple of months, first couple of months, than all of 2019 2020 and 21 combined. That's what I'm talking about. That's why we're seeing real results. The law is working as I intended, and it's saving lives. Fewer guns leads to less gun crime. And right here, the numbers are impressive. Capital region all across the state of New York. Outside of New York City, where the state police work so closely with our local police departments, or the primary law enforcement agency oftentimes a sheriff's department. Outside of New York City, shootings are down 36% in the last two years. Murders are down 30%. And indeed, we're back to the historic pre-pandemic lows of 2017 and 2019. So now we've reached a stabilized point. Well, you know, as we saw that success, we were also then simultaneously, as gun crimes were going down, we were seeing a spike in auto thefts. We decided to take a similar approach. Car thefts exploded after the pandemic, mostly upstate, and with really troubling spikes in Rochester and Buffalo, two cities I visited at the end of last summer to try and figure out what is going on here. Why? Why are they some of the worst places in America for gun thefts or for car thefts? Well, they are inspired by this 
TikTok video challenge, which you may be familiar with, that sets thieves and would-be thieves and a lot of young people, teenagers, scrambling to try and steal as many vehicles as they could because they wanted to win the competition, which was just abhorrent when you think about it, because they were going after mostly Kias and Hyundais. Used Kias and Hyundais are not usually driven by people who also have a spare Lexus in the garage. Okay? You steal their Hyundai or Kia. This is the way they get to their job. This is how they drop the kids off at school. This is how they visit their parents in the nursing home. You take that lifeline away from them so cruelly just so you can meet this challenge. I knew we had to stop this. And as I said, these are primarily people driven with lower incomes. Um, you walk out, out to an empty driveway, stop at a grocery store, your vehicle's gone. Uh, you feel helpless. And that was paralyzing many of our upstate cities for a long time. <clears throat> a long time. And people were joyriding, and we had horrific consequences. Deaths have, re have resulted. And others were using them to commit other violent crimes. And I told my team back in September, enough is enough. Let's look at the model we put forth to reduce gun violence and try to replicate it with some finer points, and I'll talk about them. We called it the CAR strategy, co coincidentally, the Comprehensive Auto Theft Reduction Strategy. It actually worked out like that. We put $50 million, $50 million into crucial technology and equipment for local police. They can't afford this. They didn't know what to use. Tools like license plate readers, drones, losing drones, helicopters, all intended to catch these perpetrators. And just like we did with gun violence, we positioned more troopers literally on the streets of these hard-hit cities on the most, in the most impacted areas. As I said, Many of these car thefts were being committed by teenagers. So at the same time, we said, let's get these young people in a different direction. And we put $5 million toward youth intervention programs. I am so proud that after this concentrated approach, literally in a matter of months, we drove down the number of car thefts dramatically. Car thefts are down 55% in Rochester and down 45% in Buffalo. Here in Albany County, they're down 25%. And if you want any physical proof, just go out to the impoundment lot where I just took a tour, seeing all kinds of vehicles that were used in the commission of many crimes, including those involved in these challenges. And so there's been car impounds related to auto theft and up, up nearly a 20% increase. So here's what we're talking about. We see a spike in a certain area of crimes. I'm able to bring in my best assets, the New York State Police. We zero in on it, and it's actually working. So now, our next challenge is retail theft, something that many would think should be left to the locals, except just like gun seizures, just like car thefts, sometimes our locals need some extra help and expertise. That's how I want to deploy our state police, with the same precision and the same purpose. And in my state of the state, I detailed a comprehensive multi-pronged strategy, including $25 million to create a specialized retail theft unit within the state police. Data collection, data sharing, and preparations to launch this are currently underway. And I want to make this a permanent part of our state law enforcement efforts. But right now, I need my colleagues in the state legislature to support this as well when we start our budget negotiations in the next couple of weeks. In the meantime, I'm putting these retail theft rings on notice. You see how we go after the illegal gun traffickers. You saw how we went after the car thieves. Well, guess what? You're next. You're next. And as I said all along, I'll give all the state police every tool they need to protect New Yorkers. Our operational budget here has increased over 22% since I took office, but it's also it's not just about getting people the best technology, the best crime-fighting tools. It's also about investing in the people of the New York State Police. Because without them, these dedicated public servants who put their lives on the line every single day, none of this would work. None of it. In order to have more individuals part of the great New York State family, we went from two academies to four. Because I said, why aren't there more people? Why aren't we increasing the ranks? And they said, we don't have enough capacity. We don't have enough graduates. I said, well, then double it. Double it. 
Well, we don't have enough space. Find the space. It's a big state. And they got it done. And I speak at all the graduations. So yes, I will now go to four graduations a year instead of two, but I'm proud to do that. And we've also increased the head count by 750 positions and are truly promoting the very best and the very brightest within our ranks. And today, Superintendent James will announce the promotion of nine troopers from the ranks of captain to lieutenant colonel. And one of them is Lieutenant Trené Young, who is with us here today. Can you wave your hand? All right, there she is, there she is. With her promotion, Lieutenant Young becomes the very first African-American woman to hold the rank of captain within the New York State Police. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Whether she intended or not, she will also help us recruiting others because especially as we're going into schools, high schools, colleges, talking to young people about careers in public service. And I will always say there's nothing more noble than public service, especially those who are willing to put on a uniform, go into harm's way with no regard for themselves. They are the foundation of a safe society. All of you are part of that. And I want to thank them. Our police agencies are stronger when they reflect the diversity of the public they serve. And that's why two years ago, we made our 30 by 30 pledge. And I said by 2030, which is creeping up on us, I want women to make up at least 30% of our state police recruit classes. And it's clear our superintendent is intentional and very committed to getting us there. So on behalf of all New Yorkers, I want to congratulate those being promoted. I thank you for your service from the past and going forward. And thank you once again for being part of the New York State the finest we've ever had our New York State Police, and I want to thank you for your service uh, every single day. And with that, let me turn it over to a true public sub servant, someone I've gotten to know and have ex incredible confidence in his ability to lead this outstanding organization and make sure that we're doing everything we can to keep New Yorkers safe. Let me turn it over to Superintendent Stephen James. Thank you, Governor. All right, I just want to expand upon some of the uh, the initiatives that the, uh, the governor has mentioned. Uh, with regard to the seized vehicles uh, that are in our impound lot, we ju did just take a visit. Luckily, the, uh, the weather cooperated, so uh, we were able to take a look out there. But I'll just give you an idea of what we uh, have been initiating. So with the seized vehicles, the Troop G Violent Gang and Narcotics Enforcement Unit, VGNet, they currently have several vehicles uh, here in our lot and they're pending forfeiture. Uh, those seizures, in majority, are out of the Capital District, and most of them deal with vehicles that were tied to illicit narcotics. Uh, whether we've got uh, the Ford F-150 back there, uh, we've got uh, other vehicles that have been tied into cases such as MDMA, uh, the synthetic uh, drug uh, that uh, is being perpetrated on the street, uh, resulting in a B felony case. Uh, there's no shortage, whether it's a, a utility vehicle, passenger vehicle, or sports vehicle. Uh, we'll continue that initiative, what we started, and this is just a microcosm uh, of what is going on throughout the state. If you were to visit the various troop headquarters, you would likely you know, find the same as far as recovered uh, evidence. With regard to the gun arrests, what is depicted here before you are just a fraction of some of what was recovered. As the governor said, the recent case transpired this Friday. But from the onset, certainly I want to express my appreciation to the Department of Environmental Conservation Commissioner, Bezos Sagos, your support and uh, camaraderie and uh, uh, interagency cooperation is greatly appreciated. And for all of your staff that participated. So with this particular case, uh, basically Friday, June 1st, uh, basically it was stemming from a firearms complaint. Uh, our partner agencies reached out to our BCI, uh, which led to contacting our special investigative unit, which is the SIU. Search warrants were executed in Rensselaer and County and uh, Albany County, and obviously it produces what you see before you today the rifles, the AR-15s, the pistol, the jig components, and the counterfeit currency. Uh, the governor, certainly since I've been in position, the three plus weeks, 
gave what our initiative ought to be. And this is just a small indication of what we look to replicate throughout the state and uh, our, our initiation to combat crime, whether it be gangs, guns, organized retail theft, auto theft, counterterrorism, or any other uh, set of circumstances that uh, the governor lays upon us. We are up for the challenge. We are successful because of our interaction with other agency personnel, and we greatly appreciate that. And so as the governor said, to do our job, it's really indication of staffing. So I'd like to really segue to discuss our staffing with regard to our recent promotions. Uh, it's oftentimes that those who are out in the field, the investigators and the troopers, do the work to recover a lot of this, but also our unsung heroes, in my estimation, are mid to upper level managers. So I just want to tell you that it gives me great pleasure to uh, identify for you the ones who are going to be promoted who are ascending to higher ranks. I'll start off with mentioning St Staff Inspector Michael Tenike to the rank of Assistant Deputy Superintendent, Counterterrorism. Give us a wave there, Mike. Major Vincent Lightcamp, to the rank of Staff Inspector, Uniform, Field Command. Captain Andre Young, wherever you may be. Okay, now like to the rank of Major on the Thruway, our New York State Thruway. Captain Ricky D. Williams, to the rank of Major Employer Relations, slash Recruitment, whether you knew or not, you got all that. You. You're welcome. <laughs> Captain Jack P. Clancy, where you at, Jack? Congrats to the rank of major at our State Police Academy, our director of training. And certainly the position that you hold is paramount because you're minting those newly formed members that are going to do the work from years to come. Lieutenant Trené D. Young to the rank of captain in the Bureau of Criminal Investigation. You'll be assigned to New York City. And to Lieutenant Maris Soldner to the rank of captain in the employee relations section. I applaud each of these newly promoted state police leaders. It's your training, your integrity, and your experience that got you here. And it will enable you to continue the mission and further display the finest traditions of the New York State Police. I offer you my heartfelt congratulations. If we get everyone out round of applause. But I would be remiss if I didn't go further. So I would like to speak specifically to soon-to-be Captain Trené Young. Trené D. Young was born and raised in the Bronx, New York. She graduated from Lehman College with a bachelor's degree in political science, and she continued her education at John Jay, where she received a master's degree in criminal justice. She began her law enforcement career in 2007, and she entered the New York State Police Academy. After graduating from the academy, she spent most of her career working in northern Westchester County on the good old Osprey Fort. In 2016, she was promoted to sergeant and stationed at Troop L Farmingdale. In 2021, she became the first African American female commission officer with the permanent rank of then lieutenant within the New York State Police. She currently supervises the violent gang and narcotics enforcement team and the Community Stabilization Team, which is essential uh, to our success, down in Westchester, Putnam, Dutchess, and Columbia County. So our official promotional ceremony will transpire later this month. But obviously, you are clearly to be recognized in the 107-year history of the New York State Police to be the first African-American female. It deserves acknowledgement and recognition. And I'm so very proud of you, and I'm pleased to be a part of this living history. I'm confident that this young trailblazer, young, Trinae Young, <laughs> you will be marking history in your life and for ours for some time to come. So congratulations, Trinae. Congratulations to all of our promotees. Keep up the proud tradition of success and excellence among the long gray line of the New York State Police. To all of you, a job well done. Thank you. Yes. I would like to invite all the promotees up so that we can take photos.
you for joining us today with some of these important announcements. Also, just to continually give New Yorkers an update on what is happening with our progress on fighting crime, something that is very much top of mind for many of them. So our statistics are trending in the right direction. If they weren't, I'd be telling you that as well to tell you what we're doing next. So we're not resting on our laurels. This is not a mission to accomplish moment. It is simply saying this is where we are today. And then you still have major confiscations of weapons, uh, very dangerous, threatening weapons uh, that just occurred in the capital region uh, a few days ago. And I thank the superintendent for helping us uh, understand there's still danger out there. And also recognizing the promotions of a number of our state police and uh, how proud we are of all of them here today. So happy to take any questions. On topics on public safety, Jason. Uh, Governor, your victory over Lee Zeldin in the last election was the smallest margin in three decades um, of any governor winning, winning, the, winning the seat. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, we know that like crime was a huge issue in that, especially among suburban voters. Uh, is today, today's announcement in terms of that, do you feel like you've learned anything from that election from 2022? And are you, is this kind of like a pivot so you want voters to understand that Democrats aren't soft on crime? Let me point to June of 2022 and encourage you to look at the television ads that I was airing about the fight we do about it back then, almost two years ago. So this is not a wake up today and say we need to do something about crime, I assure you. We have been fighting crime since I put together task force literally months on the job in the fall of 2021. In January 2022 was the first meeting I ever held bringing people from nine states, never happened in our nation's history, to this facility and saying, we need to share data on where the iron pipeline is coming, where the guns are coming, how we can interdict more coming across the border from gun shows in Pennsylvania, up 81, heading right to the Bronx, heading north to Syracuse. So I, I just, um, you can draw your own conclusions about our commitment, but it is strong. It always has been. It is a, not a new evolution at all. I've always been strong on these issues. What I needed at the time, and I was being, uh, I guess, blamed for policies that were put in place by my predecessor related to stripping away a lot of the protections of our bail laws under the guise of reform. I'm the one who in 2022 had to push the legislature beyond where they ever wanted to go and rolling back some of them. After that, recidivism went down over 40% as a result of that in 2023. We're just looking at the data now because what I did last year, if you want a reminder of last year's budget battles, the budget was one month late for one reason and one reason alone, is that I still insisted that we needed to do more to return the power to judges to have the discretion they need to look at an individual case and not have their hands tied by looking at the least restrictive means, which is no longer the standard anymore. That didn't go into effect until May, just not even a year ago. So now we're seeing in the first quarter we can analyze the data, another drop of 36% in recidivism, uh, 561 fewer. So, so nothing to do with any elections because my commitment has always been there prior to the election and certainly after. So we'll just let the facts uh, tell the rest of the story. Karen? But I can, make, but I can make it on topic because it, it kind of is. Speaking of devoting more resources to fighting crime, uh, the revenue forecast came out saying there's over a billion dollars more than anticipated. Wondering if you're going to change your budget priorities, including crime fighting and also restoring cuts to school aid. That was a nice pivot. You're really a pro, Karen, really a pro. Um, Yes, that gives us the opportunity to look at. And we knew this would come, but we also have to go on the numbers you have in November. And our budget was based on that. I'm glad we could work together with the revenue consensus. And the word consensus is important. If we weren't able to agree on our revenues with the Assembly and the Senate, it would be over in the hands of the controller. So I want to point out that there was a shared agreement and understanding that there is now $1.3 billion more than anticipated. Now, I also have to be responsible enough to know that I can't always count on 
the next year having an additional $1.3 billion. So what you look at are areas where you can make adjustments, but fully aware that if you would add more recurring expenses that commit us into future out years, that could be problematic if we don't get that same revenue. I mean, people have been talking about a recession for a number of years. I have been preparing New Yorkers for that possibility based on economists. Thank God it has not happened. It may not happen for some time, and it also may happen next year. This is what I have to do as a responsible leader in this state. So we'll be look, working with the legislature. I already had set aside $100 million to make adjustments to the funding formulas for our schools because we knew that there were some areas based on a, 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 um, a rigid formula that we wanted to make adjustments to help them out. But I also just want to point out on education funding, because of COVID money and what I did as governor, and again, I'm going to share with you all of my graph uh, because it's my favorite graph when people say that I'm cutting education that shows all the numbers since 1984 you know, down here, down here, down here. This would be the education spending under Hochul, okay? Uh, and it went up two years like that. So the thought that we could sustain that increase every year, I assume rational people would understood that can't happen. So it is not a cut when you compare us to where we were before I took office, and it's still a huge increase. And so, but I, I understand the passions behind this. I understand the desire for people to stir this up. Uh, but I also think that the concept of having a plan where you hold harmless, that regardless if your population goes down 50%, that you still get the same money you got since the year before, a formula that goes back to 2008. I'm just asking everybody to look at this. Not as much fun that, as it is to go out and rally against something as this is horrible, this is going to destroy our state as we know it. I'm going to be the one who can say, let's make the adjustments where we're necessary. Make sure that school districts that don't have the right resources are taken care of, but also saying, are we really going to be locked into a formula just because it has been done that way for a long time? And I'll never accept that as a satisfactory answer on how I do anything in state government. When someone says it's always been done this way, that's the worst thing you can tell me, because I'm going to say, explain to me that it still makes sense today. That's a long answer to your question that was pseudo on crime, but um, I think I got to the answer. All right. Okay, well, still on topic about crime. Yes, um, yes, yes Mark, go ahead, and then, and then you go on. Governor, um, is there, was there an implication in your, when you first came out that the previous administration do, didn't do enough on crime? No, what I said was, did more than oh, well, I would say that we're talking about the bail laws. Absolutely. I mean, the bail laws were um, changed dramatically back in 2019 in a way that took away the discretion that judges once had to look at the, the body of evidence, look at the individual history, look at prior records. And so I have worked hard, and we talked about that spike in crime um, that resulted and the recidivism rates that have been splashed in some newspapers recently. Um, those all go back before my reforms, and I want that understood that that is not the status today. That is under the previous laws. The data was from 2020 to 2022. And I ask people to now take a look at what happened after I held up the budget and got the legislature to understand that we have a crime wave going on right now. And I cannot have people that committed a crime being turned out again because we don't have the standards in place. Hate crimes were not even covered as being bail eligible. I had to force that in, and I have to tell you that was actually difficult a year ago, and I got it done. Uh, giving more discretion, looking at harm on harm, which means that if someone causes a second case of harm to an individual or property, that you can look at that bail as an option. Now, what I'm going to get out there and say over and over, it is becoming clearer to me that we need judges trained in the changes that we made, because I've seen recent evidence that judges are still using the past standards that no longer exist in some very high profile cases in New York City, and I'll leave it at that. So we are meeting with the Office of Court Administration, meeting with our DAs, we're having a lot of conversations. I just met with the mayor and his team about crime and subway crime, because I wanna make sure that everything we did 
is being implemented now by the DAs and the judges. The laws were changed for the better, in my opinion. So the, 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 uh, everything's in place to continue to drive down crime. I just need the cooperation of our judges, particularly. Bond, Bond. Bond retail theft, um, and maybe the acting superintendent would like to hop in here. Um, so can you explain to what degree the focus of your strategy is on these organized groups that are uh, engaging in this activity? And also, how do you address recidivism of repeat uh, retail theft offenders? Does that include adjustments to the bill? We are looking at a number of initiatives in our budget. I proposed quite a bit in my retail theft package, and some are um, less controversial, I suppose, like 20, $45 million. Uh, also assistance for, well, 45, $25 million for a state police unit that's specialized that can, again, uh, deploy people where we need them in particular. Um, also making sure that there's tax credits for the cost of security cameras for localities so they can protect themselves. So we have a comprehensive approach on this. Uh, the organized crime, this is where I also, we're working with the U.S. Attorney's offices because these people are more likely to be um, using interstate commerce, going across count, uh, state lines, especially when you're reselling the merchandise on um, platforms like eBay. This now gets out of just the jurisdiction of local governments, but also brings in the federal government. So we've had conversations about using federal laws as well. So uh, there are so many different ways to hit this. But it has to stop, just like we saw a spike in gun violence and people said it will probably never go down. Guess what? It went down. It went down. People thought that how do you get your arms around those thefts of vehicles, the Hyundai's, the Kia's, especially in our upstate cities? We got it down. We know how to do this. And the money, the resources, the intentional focus, the unrelenting questioning that I have every single week. I'm having meetings saying, okay, show me the numbers. Did we get down? How many people? I really get granular with our law enforcement to make sure that it's being effective. So uh, is there anything else you wanted to add to the question, Superintendent? Uh, yes. Thank you, Governor. With regard to the question with organization, I, I put it that like this with retail theft. The counties have yep, the counties have the luxury of focusing on their geographical boundaries. I don't have that luxury. I've got the entire state. So with regard to organized retail theft, we will use intel, we'll do trend analysis, and we are sharing the information to other agencies so that we can bridge that gap in that regard. We are putting uh, more resources on, uh, in the field. Some you see, some you will not see. But that is how we uh, really will uh, tamp this down. With regard to recidivism, I don't have the luxury to sit and wait and throw my hands up. I will arrest individuals as many times as it takes in the interim with the legislature being approached and in conversations with the DA's office, the intent is for them to bridge that gap. And I'm hopeful at some point that pendulum will swing back the other way, but in the, in the meantime, we're undeterred. I don't have that luxury. All right, we're going to move on to off topics. I do have an on topic, though. Okay. But, Governor, you talked about subway crime and you met with the mayor. When was that? And also, did it have to do with the latest round? Yesterday, somebody was kicked onto the subway tracks. On Thursday, somebody was slashed, and actually the Transit Workers Union didn't want to put their members in harm's way, as they say, because they were worried about their safety. Mm -hmm. The mayor has asked you to put more cops on the subway to repopulate that subway safety plan because he says it ran out of funding. Will you grant that request in this budget? What I will say is there's many ways that the state can even ramp up more support for uh, protection of citizens and commuters on the subway. We're going to be doing probably an event on Wednesday, so if you can hold tight, we're going to be making some announcements. We had a preliminary meeting with the mayor, uh, the uh, the chief of uh, the transit police, uh, the MTA leadership. We, we just had a meeting uh, a couple days ago and to talk about how we can pull together resources. I have man and woman power as well. I have people I can deploy in different places. So it doesn't necessarily mean that I have to pay for this entity. I can bring in people doing this. So we literally just had another meeting early this morning on this. So I will tell you this is very much top of mind. How we, you know, statistically, I can tell you things are not as bad as they've been. That doesn't help anybody feel better. And I know that. Seeing more police on the platform, more cameras, as you know, 
I am the one who said that every single car has to have cameras on it. And because I kept pushing and not taking no for an answer or that we can't do it for a few years, it'll all be done by the end of this year. But we've over 2,000 trains that have cameras on them. And that has been very helpful in solving crimes as well as the platforms. And, and I want every make sure that every conductor's booth area has cameras as well. So this is just a sampling of what is been going on, ongoing. These are not new conversations. We're always in communication with the mayor, NYPD, MTA, about, but about passenger and employee safety. But give us a couple of days because we're going to be announcing that we have uh, some more strat uh, strategies around this as well. So thank you. Would you feel more safe with more cops on the subway system? We will make people feel more safe with police, with uh, more police on the subway station. Yes, people, people want to see that. They've been asking for it. We're going to give that. We're going to see more people on the platform. The, the NYPD just surged up 1,000 people. The change from January to February, in terms of our we survey cuffs, customer attitude and um, um, their sense of security all the time, in one month with that surge, it has made a difference. So they are a deterrent, whether they're NYPD or whether they're state resources complimenting them. And also another part of it, and we'll talk about this some more, Avi's going to say, wait till Wednesday. But, but, there's, but there's also a, a lot involved in uh, people dealing with mental health crises on the subway. And so when you talk to the chief of the transit police, he would tell you that 80% of the problems or more are stemmed from that situation. So that's where we talk about, again, more state resources, amplifying what we've done. My budget requests more in this. I've already been dedicating a lot of extra effort to this with the SOS teams. I did a press event on this the other day. Don't discount the effect of programs like that. It's, it's what we have to convince people to leave the subway. In some cases, uh, when it's a really challenging situation, we have to make sure we're protecting public safety first. So many different ways we're hitting it, but I'll tell you, we are laser, laser focused on this. All right, I've got time for like one off topic, at least in the back. Governor, some cannabis farmers say they are struggling financially due to the delayed rollout of the recreational market. Um, is And they're asking for funding in the state budget. This is something you would consider. We're looking at all kinds of ways we can help our farmers. Uh, they are really the collateral damage to partially, well, largely the lawsuits that stemmed our ability to move forward for almost a year. Uh, two different sets of lawsuits, temporary restraining orders, and so they anticipated that there'd be a market they'd be selling product to. We, we thought there would be. Uh, at some point, this will level out, but it, I'm not satisfied with the pace at all, and I'm doing even more every single day to try and help uh, everybody affected by this. Part of it is the event we did a couple days ago with uh, not just farmers, but also focusing on those retail shops, shops that have already stood up legally and them having to deal with the illegal competition and how we're trying to get changes in the state law to give more power to localities, such as the ability to padlock an illegal entity and for social media platforms that give directions, that you look on for direction, aren't promoting illegal activity. And that's what's happening right now. They, sometimes you don't even see the, the listing of the legal store. You see that all the illegal operations, the bad actors surrounding them. So there's a lot of ways we have to get this back on its feet, move forward more quickly, I will not rest until this is done, but also we absolutely have to take care of uh, take care of our farmers because they've struggled an awful lot. So thank you, everybody. Really appreciate. Supreme Court rule that states can't kick Trump or former president off the ballot. What do you think of that decision? Do you agree with that ruling? Donald Trump will be defeated, no matter whether he's no matter which states he appears on. It's not a problem. Um, I, I admire the states that stepped up to try to implement based on their constitution, their reading of it, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Donald Trump will lose. Thank you.